morning, everyone. Morning. Hello, and it's nice to see you all. Important announcements first. We won't have Vesper service today. So if you know, or if you know people who attend the uh, afternoon service regularly, would you please inform them that we have canceled our afternoon service. Secondly, we know that November is our anniversary month. And we are going to celebrate our sixth year anniversary done with preschool. So sixth year and, okay, there will only be one service. November 29. Last Sunday of November, we will celebrate our sixth anniversary. It will be held at Brittany, the clubhouse of Brittany. Okay? It will be held the last Sunday, 9 a.m. Where are we going to hold our sixth year anniversary? What time? Only one service. Okay, and then, remember, two weeks ago, we made a survey. Okay, about senders and goers. We are going to present that next week. And for those who want to be trained, would you please have the time, block it off in your calendar, uh, after the service, serv after the second service, we'll have lunch together. That's pot bless. We'll meet. Okay, those who put in that survey, we want to be trained in evangelism. Okay, so today this is a preaching menu for November. Today is series break, and we'll talk about Daniel chapter three. Next Sunday we'll talk about. We'll be in the discipleship series, and we'll talk about disciples as stewards. And then third Sunday, we'll talk about the hindrances in discipleship. Fourth Sunday, it will be about disciples having an unquestionable faith. And then the fifth Sunday, which is the theme for next year, grounded and rooted up in Him. Let us pray. Our loving Father, thank you so much for orchestrating events in our life today that we are here to worship you in spirit and in truth. And as we study your word, I pray, O oh God, that you'll just be with us, challenge us, open the eyes of our hearts, that when we go out of this place, we'll really apply, Lord, the principles that we've learned today. Fill this place with your presence. Empower me. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Believers living in a non-Christian world usually experience the conflict between the laws of man and the laws of God. We are citizens of heaven, living as resident aliens in this world. One is spiritual, one kingdom, and the other one is earthly. <coughs> and in our day, there is an ever-growing gap between those two kingdoms in areas of public morality, in education, in religion, in law, in, even in medicine, ethics. And media. The question is, how should we as Christians respond to this? Now, Daniel chapter 3 is a perfect example of just such conflict between these two kingdoms. In fact, I think it is placed in the Bible for that purpose. It's a case study of dilemmas that we Christians uh, experience when we live in this non-Christian world and the choices that we are going to make. Now, the story itself is very familiar, I'm sure, to most of us and we can summarize it in a few words. The king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, made a golden statue. And he ordered, possibly it was uh, his image, and he ordered the leaders to come together and bow down and worship that image. So as the band started to play, the leaders bowed down, everyone there, except for three young Hebrew men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When the news arrived to the king, that there were three men who didn't bow down to the image. He was so furious and he asked his leaders to call those three men and gave them another chance. They refused to bow down a second time. And so the king asked his strongest men 
to throw them in the furnace. But the Lord miraculously delivered them and congratulated them of their faith and promoted them. That's the story. It was a remarkable story. But before we go farther, let us note two key observations. First, refusing to bow down is or was a clear violation of the king's command. It was a deliberate and premeditated disobedience that would result in their death. And secondly, <coughs> the basic issue involved was worship. Daniel chapter 3 mentions worship 11 times. To bow down was an act of worship. So the three young men, you know, even if it meant breaking the law, they decided that they would rather die than violate their conscience. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we look into the lives of these three men and this particular event in chapter 3, I want us to see what we should ex expect as we strive to live godly lives and how we might better prepare ourselves during these unchanging or changing and uncertain times. And there are three things that I would like for us to know. The first two would deal with our expectation, and the second one is how we might better prepare ourselves. First, godly living creates opposition. Aiming to strive to live a godly life, we must expect opposition. We must expect persecution. That we see in verses 1 to 12. I won't read the verses anymore, but here we would know, or we would see that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were about to go, uh, were, uh, were going to, uh, it's, it's a daily schedule for them, doing their jobs. They're about to do their usual thing. But times have started to change. Circumstances, the culture, society had changed that made their belief stood out a bit more and caused opposition. And this seems to be counterintuitive, right? When we live godly lives, we expect that we would have an easy life. But there's a problem with that kind of thinking because we would be confused easy life with a blessed life. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe that God will bless us if we live godly lives. And the scripture tells us about that. So, uh, allow me to read a couple. Proverbs chapter 3, verses, verse 33. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but He blesses the home of the righteous. In Psalm 128, verse 1, Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in His ways. God blesses us if we live godly lives, if we walk in His ways. But, Blessing doesn't always equate with ease of circumstance or ease with an easy life. God might bless us that way, but true blessing is experiencing the presence of God in the midst of life, whatever it brings. So you might experience good or bad, but the blessing there is experiencing Him. For example, God's blessing is often finding comfort. In the midst of suffering. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. Finding peace amid trouble. In John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Living a godly life doesn't guarantee an easy life. In fact, it's the opposite. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We need to realize that as we strive to live a godly life, we are going to face opposition and persecution, especially during times of times of change and times of uncertainty. Second, godly living 
causes us to make hard choices. Aiming to strive to live a godly life, we must envision that we'll make hard choices in the future that we see in verses 13 to 15. These guys have to choose between worshiping a false idol, a false god, but they would keep their physical life. Or they would worship a true and living God and they would lose their physical life. Suppose you were in their shoes. It's between your faith and your life. You know, we can make so many rationalizations, you know, we people. We make many rationalizations. Pastor, you know, do as the Babylonians do. When you're in Babylon, do the, as the Babylonians do. You can make that, that as an excuse. Or perhaps you would say, you know, Pastor, the, the, the king has been so good to us slaves and he even he even gave us good work it's so ungrateful naman for me not to bow down or third you know the lord lord you know my heart i am bowing down i'll pretend to bow down but my heart is standing up you can use that as an excuse or perhaps you would say lord they're forcing me against my will to bow down okay i'll, I'll bow down but i know you understand please forgive me or perhaps you would say, well, I'm in, in Babylon. Nobody in Jerusalem would know. I would pretend to bow down. I would bow down. Or my favorite, if I won't bow down, I'm a dead meat already. Right? We can use those rationalizations. But as I've said before and I've mentioned it several times, if we want to compromise, you will always find an excuse. You'll always find an excuse. Now, it is not too often here in our country that we would risk our lives for our faith, right? But we know that we will still make hard choices that would greatly affect our lives. For example, you are in a very tight fix and you, you can't give your tithes and offering. What will you do? Lord, you will understand. I'll just list this. Satubi. Or perhaps in your business deals. You would compromise. You would make big decisions. For example, just like last night, perhaps you were invited by your friends to wear costumes for the Halloween party. What would you do? Or perhaps we could see this among our youth. Your crush, he's so foggy, and he's courting you. But he's not a Christian. Will you accept him? Or perhaps... You're the man, and this is your cross, and she's making, you know, uh, there are signs that she likes you too. Will you court him, her? Or perhaps you're in a relationship, but your, your boyfriend, your girlfriend is not a Christian. And pastor says, do not be unequally yoked to an unbeliever. What will you do? You see, we're going to have hard, we're going to make hard choices. Very difficult. Or the issue would be, Every Sunday, your parents would like you to go to church, but it is basketball time. What will you do? Hard choices. Trying to live a godly life. And number three, are we number three? Yeah. God believing commits everything into the hands of God. It is a life of faith. This is how we are going to prepare so that we can make that stand, brothers and sisters in Christ. It is found in verses 16 to 18. Allow me to read again those verses. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and He will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if He does not, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of God you have set up. These guys have made a very hard choice. And the consequences were severe. We respect that kind of stand. We honor that kind of stand. But the question is, how are we going to prepare ourselves? How are we going to make that kind of choice of that decision at the battle, in, in, the, in the battle of the moment? How? The responses that we make when we face difficult choices, brothers and sisters in Christ, are not made on the spur of the moment. 
You have to prepare. That's why Apostle Paul says, train yourself to be godly. <coughs> Look at what verse 17a again says. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. What gave them the confidence to speak boldly before the king? Three little words. Three little words. God is able. Amen? They knew their God and they knew what God can do, could do. God is able to deliver. God is able to res rescue. God is able to save. And how did they know that? Because they were taught of it. They knew that God, what God had done in the past. When He spoke words, the universe came to being. When He took a lump of clay, He formed man. When He took a reed from the man, woman came. And then he's, he, he sent wind that, that separated the Red Sea. He set a table in the wilderness and fed his children with manna and quail. He caused the walls of Jericho to tumble down. You see, brothers and sisters in Christ, perhaps you're asking, how did they know that? They had been taught of those stories when they were still little children. That's the importance that we've been telling you. Parents, share your faith. Share those Bible stories to them. So you see, these Young men knew they had a God. They knew what He had done. And they also knew what He could do. <coughs> Therefore, in their own time of crisis, brothers, they knew beyond the shadow of any doubt, God is able. Let me say that plainly. Because they knew what God had done in the past, they knew what God could do in the present. This is a great value that comes from learning the Word of God. You will discover who He is. And you'll know what He can do. What He has done and what He can still do. Knowing God gives us the courage, gives us the strength to stand our ground no matter who is standing against us. Then in verse 17b, it reads, And He will rescue us from your hand, O King. There is a note of strong hope in their voices when they face the mightiest man in the world that day or during that time. Now, I, I can imagine that the fiery furnace is several meters away from them. They could smell it. They could see it. They knew the price for disobedience, but they disobeyed anyway. Why? Because that deep down in their soul, somehow, some way, they know that God will rescue them. They expected some kind of deliverance, but they didn't know how, they didn't know when, they didn't know where, they didn't know what. Now, what made them talk like that? I answer very simply, they had a very big God. They believe in a God who could do anything. That's why in Hebrews 11.34, it refers to them. It says, by faith, they quench the fury of the flames. My friends, verse 17 tells us God is able. Verse 18 tells us God is sovereign. The sovereignty of God. May I read verse 18 again? But... Even if he does not. We want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. So we come to the most powerful words of all. They said they, there are several stages of faith. And I believe that this is the highest form. Here they are saying, we know God can deliver us. But we don't know. If he will deliver. Either way, we will still, we won't bow down before your image, okay? Basically, they were already signing their death certificate. And they knew it. 
how many of us would have the courage to face death like that? What a noble example of faith. They hope for a miracle. Okay? They hoped for a miracle, but they didn't demand one. They did demand it. They left everything into the hands of our sovereign God. I would like for you to consider the first phrase, but even if he does not, we all want our prayers answered, but even if he does not, we want long life and good health, but even if he does not, we want our business to flourish, but even if he does not, we want miracles to happen, but even if it does not. We want our children to prosper, but even if it does not. If God says no to your cherished dreams and fondest hopes, would you still trust Him? If God says no to your future plans, would you still serve Him? If God says no, even when through tears you're praying for your loved one who is sick, would you still follow him? Would you still follow him? That brings us face to face with a truth that we seldom talk about very much. And it's called the unpredictability of God. The doctrine of the unpredictability of God which means that God does what He wants us, what He wants to do, not what we expect Him to do. These three young men had a big God, but they also knew that their personal deliverance was perhaps, was, or it might not be, most, the most important to God. Did you get that? They knew they had a big God. That's why they said, our God could deliver us. And then, in verse 18, but even if He does not, they also knew that their personal deliverance might not be, might not be the most important thing to God. And that's a very key insight for most of us. Because when we get into a tight place, the first thing we want to be assured is we will get out of that mess okay. We'll get out of trouble, fine. That's why in our prayer we say, Lord, would you please help me get out of this jam? Would you please help me get out of this trouble okay? And then we insert a little phrase, if it is your will. But you don't say that loud. Why? Because you're hoping that God's will is the same as yours. That's the problem. But often it is not. We see through a dark, through a glass darkly. And at best, we only see a glimmer of God's purposes. It's just like peeking through a pinhole. But God, you know, He sees the whole panorama of history stretch out of Him. Brothers, there are so many mysteries in this life. Deuteronomy 29, 29 reads, The secret things belong to the Lord our God. Which means, He knew why everything happens. But He doesn't tell anyone of us. Did you get that? He knows why everything happens, but He's not telling anyone else. Consider this. In Acts chapter 12, the Apostle James was killed with a sword. In the same chapter, Apostle Peter was delivered miraculously. Why? Why? A normal child is born healthy. Then another child will be born severely retarded. Why? Some of our prayers have been answered. Others apparently or not? Why? Why? The list could go on. 
to infinity. There are so many mysteries in this world, in this life, and none have clear answers. But at the end of the day, brothers and sisters in Christ, I've been telling this, I've been repeating this principle, I've been repeating this truth, I've been repeating this rule a lot of times. At the end of the day, there is only one answer. He is God and we're not. That's the first spiritual law. law. We've learned that in our recovery. I, 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 I encountered that in Celebrate Recovery, but I've been holding on to the truth. He is God, and we're not. Psalm 115 verse 3 reminds us, Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases Him. He does whatever pleases Him. What we find in Daniel chapter 3 is faith in God, not just faith in God's deliverance. Faith in God, not just faith in God's deliverance. These young men were saying, we are sure of God, but we are not sure of what He will do. No prosperity theology there. The verses then, 19 to 30, tell us what happened when they defied the king. First, they were punished in verses 19 to 23. The king, he was so infuriated that he ordered the flame, the, the fire, to be seven times hotter. And he ordered his strongest men, the strongest men to throw these three young Hebrew men. You know, the flames were so hot that the men who threw these three young Hebrews were more or less cremated on the spot. Now I would like for us <coughs> to see it's important to remember that when they were cast into that furnace, these three, they weren't expecting deliverance. They never say God will rescue us, but then they said, but even if he does not, right? So they were not, as far as they know, they would not they would perish in the flame. And then in verses 24 to 27, they were preserved. This part of the story, brothers and sisters in Christ, shows us the amazing care of God with His servants. You know, when Nebuchadnezzar looked at the furnace, he was expecting that they were being roasted like chickens at uh, Kenny Rogers. But he was stunned because he saw them, they were walking, unharmed, unbound. And there was a fourth man walking with them. And you know what he said? King Nebuchadnezzar said, he's the son of the gods. What an insight to a, by a pagan king. Who is that fourth man? Who is that fourth man? Those who are studying uh, Revelation with me and those who are in my GG. Now, this is an example, according to our theologians like Dr. Frank, this is Christophany. The Old Testament appearance of the Son of God going down from heaven in bodily form. He stepped across the ramparts of heaven and walked down the starry staircase there directly to the blazing furnace. And tore the flames, cool it man. And they did. You know, that's the difference with us now. We enjoy the aircon room here. Then, they, it's just like they were also having that same experience, except that they were surrounded by flames. What a God. What a God. But here, I am struck by the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ appears on only, at only one place in chapter 3. Where was he in chapter 3? In the fiery furnace, waiting for the young men. So outside, they were three. And then when they were thrown in the furnace, they were four. And when King Nebuchadnezzar called them again, they were three. Jesus never manifests himself except inside the fiery furnace 
at the very moment when he was needed the most. What a lesson for all of us. You know, so often we go through life, days and weeks and months, without the consciousness of the presence of God in our lives. That's why we go, we, we go into, you know, we sin because you're not conscious that God is with you. And now when troubles come, when the flames lick your feet, and when life tumbles in, Lord, then you discover that Jesus has been by your side every, the entire time. It is in the fires of life that we experience the presence of Christ most powerfully. He is always there. He is always there, brothers and sisters in Christ. But He makes His Himself known most of the time in the fiery furnace. And then in verses 28 to 30, they were promoted. The king not only promoted these young Hebrew men, but he also promoted their God. Verse 29 reads, Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save in this way. Instead of being fried, instead of being roasted in the furnace, they were promoted. Now they were helping, at the time they were already helping the king to run his empire. And that's a very good reward for people who strive to live godly lives. People who refuse to bow down to false gods. Yes, God believing is really difficult. It doesn't always end up the way we would like. Now, let me balance what I've been saying the past 30 minutes. If, because if I'm not going to do this, I'll give you an incomplete picture. Suppose we ask the question, does living by faith or living a godly life, always re you will always receive a miracle? The answer must be no. The end of Hebrews 11 makes that very clear. Verses 35b to 38 <laughs> record the trials of faith. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned and they were sold into they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Who are these poor and unfortunate souls? What have they done to deserve such kind of punishment? The writer of Hebrews simply calls them others. Others. They are others who live by faith. Just as much as Noah, Abraham, Moses, Joshua, and the three young kids, and the three young adults. Please get it clear in your minds, brothers and sisters. Their faith wasn't weaker, those others. Their faith wasn't weaker. If anything, if there is anything, if anything, their faith for me was greater. Because it enabled them to endure the incredible suffering. They were not weaker saints, but they were for me greater saints because they didn't turn from their faith. And they continued even when things weren't doing right. Yes, godly living is really living by faith. You step, it's a step of faith that will not guarantee you where will you live, where it will lead. Did you get that? It's a step of faith that you would know, you wouldn't know where will it lead you. If you are Noah, continue to build the ark and hope that it will float. If you are Abraham, 
You will set out to the promised land and hope that you'll find it before you die. If you are the three young men, you will not bow down and hope that when you are thrown into the furnace, you will not perish in the flames. My friends, sometimes it works out the way we hope. Other times, it doesn't. Faith means stepping out with no guarantee. Our God is able. Amen? Amen. Our God is mighty to save. Amen? Amen? But even if He does not, I will still put my trust in Him. What say you, Abraham? You endured an incredible test of your faith with your son Isaac. My son, the Lord himself will provide a sacrifice. But even if he does not, I will still put my trust in him. What say you, Polycarp, the bishop of the church of Smyrna, and he was asked to recant his faith the one last time, or he will die as a martyr. Eighty and six years have I served him, and he has never wronged me. But how can I now deny my Lord and King? But even if he does not, I will still put my trust in him. What say you, Martin Luther, in April of 1521? He was accused of heresy by the Council of Worms, by John Eck and the Catholic Church. What say you, Martin? My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand. I can do no other. God, help me. But even if he does not, I will still put my trust in Him. How about you? When you stand for God, when you obey Him, what if I lose my job? What if my boyfriend or my girlfriend leaves me? What if I lose my money, my wealth? What if, I, if they'll put me into prison? What if I lose my life? Brothers and sisters in Christ, can we say, but even if he does not, I will still put my trust in him. When we truly know who we believe in, we can face opposition and hard choices with peace and gladness in our hearts because our, eter our eternities will be in the presence of the one who is able and mighty to save. Amen? What a joy, Lord, to know you are able and mighty to say. But in spite of the fact, Lord, of knowing what you can do, may we say, but even if you're not, we will still put our trust in you. Amen.